Well, welcome everybody back to another episode. And I actually appreciated what you guys said about uh, Dami Sani. And we had a conversation after that. And we've had conversations since about what uh, I said about his dad and what his dad does. And it turns out like a lot of you can actually relate and um, that are from that kind of background can kind of relate to what he said. And it was actually humbling to hear what he said, to be honest with you. And uh, he says very, uh, very much thank you to everybody that says that. And so did his dad. But anyway, tonight's guest has had quite a few lines of jobs, ranging from a marketing assistant at Stage Time, then went to work at K3 Media, K3 Media, as a videographer and was in the social media marketing team, then worked for Surrey Police, which I'm interested to talk about, and then worked for, um, and then, sorry, volunteers at the British American Football Association. Now she works for Celebrity Esports as an executive producer and production coordinator. It's Tara Bunker. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. Now, I'm, I'm curious, before we get into it, I'm curious how you went from a marketing assistant and then you went from a videographer to working in Surrey Police. How did, <laughs> how did, that's like, that's two different kind of, that's completely, completely different. How did you, how did you do that? Or why did you do that? Um, that's a question. Oh, gosh. Well, I kind of, I mean, my my first kind of real job kind of full time was with Key 3 Media um, mm. when I left university. So I was a marketing assistant for stage time, kind of part time, just to, get into kind of the working world <clears throat> um and then yeah I just kind of joined the team at key three offering kind of video services as the videographer um and with them learning kind of like social media management so we would work with different clients from like gyms and car dealerships all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um and then I saw a job um open up at Surrey Police for a communications assistant mm -hmm. um and kind of doing all the corporate communications there so I just applied and and you know went for an interview and I just fell in love with the job and I'd like to think I got on quite well with the manager um Jay and I still get on really well with him now and everything so yeah it was uh it's definitely quite a jump and uh it, I was working in the kind of sorry police a lot of the social media stuff there so it wasn't too much of a change it's just very different from a kind of like marketing to policing but the premise was still quite the same so yeah yeah, yeah wow and then um I, I think it's a was it was it something you'd always so because your your roles are like kind of they kind of all like click together in the same niche but was the police did you ever see yourself actually working there like could you could or for a better question I think would be could you see yourself working there just now or were you always was it always just like it was just an opportunity like a stepping stone type thing it was definitely when I think when I first kind of was presenting the opportunity it was definitely just a kind of in the moment opportunity to maybe get me further on down the line of a kind of like a future career and mm -hmm. um, you know the it was a bigger organization you know I think it was more security in the job and everything like that mm -hmm. and um I kind of working for key three I was in Shrewsbury which is quite a small town in comparison to say Surrey mm -hmm. um so it was opportunity because I didn't really want to stay up um kind of in the West Mids I, I wanted to kind of get out of there and branch out and and kind of always kind of step up every single role I get I wanted to kind of move up to that next level Mm -hmm. um so yeah it was and then just kind of I think I think two weeks in I realized actually this is an incredible job um and it was just a very happy coincidence so yeah <laughs> have um because we did speak before about um how you're happy to move if, for jobs and stuff like that is that always been something like you've been comfortable with like moving from place to place or is it something that you've had to adapt to, adapt to it yeah, no, I mean, um, so I grew up in West London. Uh, I grew up in Hounslow, born there. Um, right, and then yeah. um, I've moved around quite a few times. So kind of moved from there to Surrey and then from Surrey, moved all the way to Shrewsbury with my parents because um, they bought a pub and then moved wow. from Shrewsbury. We moved in Shrewsbury a couple of times and then um, I went to university then down in Chichester. So completely kind of, you know, four or five hour journey yeah, um, no direction. <laughs> yeah I really wanted to get away apparently <laughs> um and then moved back up to Shrewsbury and then yeah moved back down so I'm in Surrey um I've been in Surrey then since 20 2018 I think yeah 2018 so a few years now mm, wow if you had to like um a, a different question if you had to say one place that you would love to move to it doesn't need to be in the UK it can be like you know it can be anywhere where, where would you say it would be definitely Canada 
Really? I don't know what it is. I've never been. I've never been to Canada, but just there is something about it which just really like. I don't know. I just feel like I'd be really happy there. <laughs> it just sounds so juicy, but yeah. And you know, and and um, kind of. I will go into it, but like my kind of love for the film production world. I know it's growing there massively. Um. So yeah, that'd be a kind of a dream for me to to be able to move there. So. Yeah, I'd say like it's a, the more video video has moving there, and I know a lot of people don't like him. Personally, I love him to be honest with you. Um, but Drake with his whole OVO crew thing, they've kind of like completely blown up there. So now a lot of artists and that are actually moving from LA to Canada because they're like there's way more opportunities and way more money and all that stuff in that type of environment. But yeah, if you had to say one place in Canada, where would where would you move to? Would See, that classic I would, no, Toronto no. type thing. <laughs> yeah, I guess it probably would have to be a city. I think I've learned from just moving around anyway, kind of. I'm more of a city person, even though I'm quite chill in myself in the sense I'm quite like a kind of, you know, I don't really mind a day of doing nothing, but I like the busyness of a city. So if I was to move anywhere, I'd want it to be, a, you know, like a busy city. Um, so as long as there was that in, in Canada, it could be anywhere really, so. Yeah, damn, damn. Well, <laughs> I want to talk about the um, celebrity esports because as I said before, when I was younger, I actually did, um, I mean, we're, I say younger like I'm really old but it was I'm 26 now so it would have been about it would have been when I it would have been 11 years ago and then up until I was maybe 18 I did um well in fact 12 years ago yeah up until I was 18 so it's about four years I did the whole you know Call of Duty esports type thing for <laughs> a long time and major league gaming and game battles and stuff so I think a lot of people that watch this will be interested in um before we get to the American football thing, which I realise is the kind of ties into the exact same thing. But what kind of esports is it like you worked on or you work in? Um, so it's not the typical kind of like Call of Duty, Fortnite leagues or anything like that. Um, it's very much games that, you know, anyone can play. And it's not like, you know, you have to be so skilled in it. And it's not, there is an element of competitiveness to it, but it's very much that sort of, entertainment side of it as well um, my boss has always very much said the kind of e in celebrity esports is for entertainment so it's that sort of enjoyable of watching that people can understand the esports world without having to fully go into like those huge tournaments and arenas and everything like that or that sort of like you know because I've, I've watched a few myself with like call of duty or, or those sort of like huge esports tournaments if you don't, I think if you don't fully understand gaming, it can just get completely lost over you. So it's it's that sort of, um, I guess it's like an introduction to esports and, and sharing the fact that, you know, gaming can be for everyone. Um, with the, the fact that you've got people like Jimmy Carr and everything, you know, it, it, you can't not laugh with it. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it really. Damn, what, um, what kind of, if, if you're, obviously you might not be allowed to talk about it, but if you are allowed to talk about it, what kind of uh, celebrities have you, what kind of celebrities? Yeah, what kind of celebrities do you work for? Is it like your work with, sorry, is it your big time celebrities or is it like local United Kingdom type celebrities? Um, I guess it's a bit of both really. Um, so we, we, we've just done our episode one, which, um, you know, is, is available to watch and everything. I'll do a selfish little plug there. But mm -hmm. um, we had, you know, Jimmy Carr, Joel Domit, you know, big comedians. We had um, Adebayo Akinfenwa, you know, big footballer. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got people like, you know, like Chris Hughes and Cam, like Love Island favourites. So we have a real diverse amount of kind of people on there. We've got content creators, um, Jack Bean and SV2. Um, Jack Bean's huge on TikTok, SV2 is huge on YouTube. Um, you know, it's it's we have kind of, I guess, any type of audience demographic type, you know, celebrity. Mm. We've we've I like to think we've covered it quite well. So yeah, it's it's and hopefully can only then grow. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. How does it, how does it, because I think I've, I've met a few celebrities in my time range from like example to, I actually met um, one of Little Mix's grannies a long time ago at Tea in the Park, which is a weird thing, but like, yeah, we had a conversation for a while and uh, and it comes to like, just like DJs and things like that. Plus I worked as a doorman for a long time. So I've met like, you know, your classic Geordie Shore team and stuff like that. But yeah. for me, it was quite, um, some of them were a bit intimidating to be around just because they're that bigger personality. It's like when I met Scotty T, he's a he has a huge personality. So it was a bit, yeah. it was, and I'm quite calm and collective. So it was weird for me to be around something like that because I couldn't deal with it too much because he's just like bouncing off the walls and stuff like that. 
But what what how do you feel being around like celebrities and stuff like that? Like how do you react to it? Um, I think well, I don't think I actually had an issue with you know working with any of the celebs that we had. You know, they were all really actually surprisingly lovely. I was expecting there to be some divas, mm. and there weren't. You know, um, I think I had a bit of like a kind of imposter syndrome set in because you know it was my first role as a kind of. Uh, production manager and coordinating all that sort of stuff and you know liaising with the celebs on the set and everything I kind of had a moment of like oh my gosh should I actually be the person doing this I feel like I'm not the right person but they you know they made it just really actually quite easy um mm. and I think that was quite a pleasure that obviously I think a lot of people think oh you know people like say Jimmy or or, or whoever you think oh they are famous people know who they are they're going to have this sort of like um thing about them but no, they were actually a real pleasure and they actually made it a lot kind of easier to do. So yeah, full credit to them. Damn, yeah. So what what is it that attracted you to the whole um videographer, videographer slash producer slash, you know, that type of being in type of um because when people say media, they always presume uh, you want to be like an actor or something like that. Like mm -hmm. the, the normal person kind of presumes that. But what kind of attracted you to wanting to work in media versus working in like a you know the casual nine to five you know get up every morning Monday to Friday type job yeah um so this is gonna be really really cheesy but I, I guess I kind of I started doing um like small family videos about god probably like 10-15 years ago now mm -hmm. um you know just filming trips going to Ireland seeing my grandparents and and filming that to then put with a cold play music and and make a little montage so I actually then realized from doing that I actually really enjoyed it and then kind of going into college being like oh my god you can actually have a career in this this is awesome um and I'm sort of the, the sort of person where when I have my visions or like kind of something set I like I want to make it happen mm. so um just research into every possible you know path I could take and and I never planned on going to uni and then realizing that it could have really helped out I then applied like clearing week you know um I, I did everything quite last minute when I realized that you know I really wanted to do this and I had full backing from my parents and everything um because I think when, when I was kind of looking into it as a career it wasn't as big as it is now mm. you know it's crazy within I think even just like within like I mean I started university in 2014 which doesn't seem like that long ago but when you look at the difference of like how you know YouTubers weren't really a thing then like people would laugh at you if you wanted to do like YouTubing and all that sort of stuff. Whereas now everyone seems to, you know, have a type of kind of social media influence um, in their, in their life sort of thing. So um, yeah. So, and then just, I got better at it and, you know, I, I did projects freelancing and realized that I really wanted to do it. And then I did a lot of like um, sport videography and photography at university alongside my degree um, and realized, Oh, you know I can do this you know freelancing and stuff and my degree was very much film production so like the kind of bigger film sets and everything and um, so I, I was able to kind of see all sides of the creative industry both the, the kind of bigger projects the smaller ones um, and yeah just I've been very lucky that kind of every chance I've gone for something you know I've, I've been presented it and, and been accepted so yeah just it's that sort of cheesy family videos that then have somehow got me here so yeah and um, so you've kind of always had a, a aim of where kind of of an aim of where like you wanted to be rather than like some people that like you know it takes them you know like to a certain age and then it clicks and you've have, have you so you've kind of like well I suppose have you kind of always had that even though you're doing the family videos and that had you always had an aim that that's what you wanted to do or was there like another job you were like wanting to do at the other side of that well, I think I think <laughs> I think my first ever job I remember wanting to do was being an architect, um, which is wow. very different. It's only because me and my sister, when we were younger, we would like draw out a floor plan of like our dream house. Mm. Mine would be like five stories high with a lift and a cinema room, and <laughs> well, and I was like, oh yeah, I could do this as a career. And then I don't know whatever happened to that, but I, I then just suddenly, you know was taking pictures and then you know family would be like oh that's a really great picture and then would start doing more and then realized oh you know I, I think I have quite a skill at this and and realizing that it's not I mean there are difficulties in getting a job in any kind of career but you know there were opportunities to do it mm. um and you know like I said having the full backing from my parents and my family to go for it um they, they've always kind of said that 
we they kind of saw that I did have this kind of burning passion for it um, and they never had that themselves so they only wanted to kind of encourage me to do it mm. um, because you know I'm, I'm very passionate and I'm the sort of person where if I really enjoy what I'm doing you know I'll, I'll do the, the best sort of version of it so yeah so I was quite lucky with that yeah yeah I think like what uh what you know with with wanting to do media I mean I've had to even though I'm still kind of doing my second year and things like that I'm still facing the thing from people like you know why do you want to do this why do you you know you tell you know why do you want to do this why not come do this why not be you still get like a type of um not a hatred of that but like a type of negativity towards what you're doing how do you have, have you ever had that and if you if, if you have had it how have you dealt with it oh um I wouldn't say like full negativity I think it's a misunderstanding of actually what I do mm. um I think you know when I would say to people oh I work in like communications or I work in social media they're like oh you tweet for a living it's like I really wish it was that easy to say I just tweet for a living you know there is so much more behind the scenes of any like kind of communications or social media management or even like you know oh I'm a photographer as so you just take pictures I was like I wish it was just that easy that I could just point and shoot and I get the finished product um so I think it's it's that sort of um to begin with explaining to say like family or friends exactly what I do and and they'd be like oh okay but then I think when I've shared then my work and and like stories about you know projects I've been on and stuff and they've seen the excitement of me telling it they've realized that actually no this is a lot more than it is and you know um, kind of explaining just how much planning goes into things and stuff and, it, and it's not as easy as people think um, so yeah I wouldn't say negativity I think it's just that sort of misunderstanding um, and then you know having to kind of educate people a little bit as to actually what goes on in the creative industry mm. um, it's not just making films and then watching it there is so much more that goes on so yeah people yeah. never people don't realize like I realized that when I did um, my sound production stuff as well I thought it was easiest just jumping in a studio working I worked with bands and a few um grime artists for, for, for those of you who don't know that's a version of like I would say grime is like UK kind of like UK rap type stuff so I worked yeah. with a couple of people like that around here and what I realized is it genuinely is not just as simple as making a song going in and recording it doesn't work like that it has to get advanced by so many people and then it comes back to you it is it's yeah, I think there is a lot behind the scenes, but something uh, I, I like asking people, two questions I like asking people, actually the first one is that, what's like your biggest flaw personally and your biggest flaw professionally? Ooh, okay. Um, definitely, I think biggest flaw professionally is up until, I think quite recently, I think up until this year, actually, you know, I was very much like a yes person um and I very much felt that you know me taking on loads of projects and you know saying oh yeah I can do that no problem I very much was under the impression that you know doing all this work would get me you know the results I wanted so if it would come up to like say promotions or or anything like that I I naively thought you know like oh you know I'll go into this interview and they'll be like oh yeah we saw all this work that Tara did you know let's let's give it to her and and I think I learned the hard way after kind of burning out that that's not always the case. Um, so kind of very much up until this year, I very much, you know, was like, yeah, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. I'm just burnt myself out. And I was very much a people pleaser um, in that sort of sense. Not as not a massively bad thing, but I think, you know, sometimes um, people can take advantage of the fact that you'll just happily do it. Um, so I think that's professionally kind of my flaw personally. Um I think I'm too invested in my career in the sense that I sometimes, you know, don't switch off from work. Um, and it's a bit difficult. So like sometimes, you know, social media management, social media is 24 mm seven. -hmm. So I would have to, con I would have to check my phone and stuff like that at dinner or, and my, my dad would be like, you know, you're, you're having dinner, you turn your phone off. And I'd be like, I just wish it was that easy. And, you know, I look back now and, and I should have just done it because if it's not like you know an absolute emergency then it can wait like 10 minutes but starting out in in the kind of the working world I was very much like you know I have to be on it I have to be on it and and I never really switched off from work so yeah I think I kind of put myself in that just because I know I don't have many commitments doesn't mean I should be working more than anyone else so yeah. I always think 
I was thinking, no, the reason I asked this question, I love explaining it as well, is because that I think when you can identify your flaws professionally and personally, it means you can overcome them. So it means you know yeah. there's a flaw there, but you need to advance it. I think if somebody turned around and has ever, nobody has done or has ever to say that I can't think of a flaw, I'm like, well, that's not a good thing. Like, it's not <laughs> good to be flawless. You kind of need to, because then you advance on it, but then you maybe develop another flaw that then you advance on that and then so on, so on, so on. It's like, it's like the whole... Um, improving one percent every week type thing it's literally yeah. you need to do that to be able to like get better especially when like you're involved in media and in, in a world that where like there's hundreds of other people that do your job but then if you're not on it on it all the time somebody else will be on it all the time and then it, it, it it's like a like you're saying for promotions and things like that it may not affect it Pro, i can't comment on it obviously because i've never been yeah. had a job in media but maybe it doesn't but it, you can you could see why it could develop it but I think that something else is always, always interested in asking I'm always interested in asking sorry is people like yourself that are involved in like heavily involved in media is that say you're um because we all get your social medias if you're comfortable with giving them at the end of this so we can like yeah. blast them out to people so everybody can everybody can hit you up as per se but would you say it is important to watch what you put on social media and I'm not talking like you know anything that shouldn't be on there I'm generally talking about like any sort of views you may have and stuff like that does would you say that is really important versus like versus maybe not as much for getting jobs because there's a lot of people that I've spoken to being like yes yeah, your sure, social media does get monitored you really need to like chill back but then some people are saying if you as long as you don't post anything that you feel shouldn't be posted but what's what's your opinion on that type of stuff um I definitely kind of agree with the whole like you know I mean, everyone has access to social media now. I think even my granddad at once had a Facebook page we set up for him. So, you know, everyone can have a, a profile somewhere. Mm. Um, I definitely think it should be factored into, you know, applying for jobs. The amount of job applications I've applied for where they, they ask for your social media handles because they want to look into kind of, you know, who you are as a person. Mm. Um, and I think if you don't reflect who you actually are on, on online, then it can give off the wrong impression that they might hire someone you know they had a great interview great but you know they who they might see online as well is might help you know kind of as to why they've been hired and then if in person they're like wait you know this isn't who we thought you were that can obviously have a, a big impact but um I think you should I think you should post you know obviously be safe and stuff like that but I think you should post true to who you are um you know the the, the ability to have a private Instagram and all that sort of stuff and you know that's an option there I think um I like I like to use social media as kind of like a memory bank so like I'll put photos up and and I'll, I'll look at memories from years ago on Facebook because I'm one of those people that never actually created a new Facebook so I get those cringy status reminders from like 10 years ago of when I was in school and just it's that sort of you know I Jesus, use it as yeah. a way to keep in contact with family as well because I've got family all over the world so um Wow. I'll share funny things but I like to think that whatever I share is I would still do in person um I mean that's why I, I, I'm still a massive snapchat user because especially in the last year of lockdown um I very much kind of would still be myself on that just rather than instead of being with everyone else I was able to do it on snapchat mm -hmm. so yeah I think I think it just depends on how you use it I think if you're going to be silly and, and post things that are just inappropriate then yeah it's just don't even bother so but yeah a lot of jobs that uh, I've been applying for and speaking to the um opportunities that I'm trying to get involved in now is they have asked for my social media due to the fact that like what do you do every day I'm like oh well, obviously I have a podcast and um, yeah there's maybe another one coming is it, to run along the same time and everybody's like well okay what's their social media then like we need to know yours and theirs because if you're posting stuff but then you're also if I'm posting it's just literally pictures of me and my face being motivating, to be honest with you. But if or the gym stuff or that, and if people are like, well, if you're posting that, so how does that reflect from what, you know, you're trying to push from your pod? You need to, it's a weird circle because then they're like, but then it reflects on that, but then it also reflects on us. And I think what a lot of people um, don't think about, and uh, a lot of people I actually know that have kicked in the bum and told them they really need to, they really need to change what they're posting is uh, the, the fact that like, when you're posting something on social media, or even when you're out and about in that, you're not necessarily just reflecting yourself and your family, but it's who you work for. Because yes. say you work in like a specific, I won't say any shop's name deliberately, but if you work in a specific shop or um, just because there's actually a shop across the street and I can see it, but just that particular shop, if you worked in there, 
um, and you were misbehaving or something on the Friday or Saturday night or something, then somebody walks into the shop, they might not get, they might, they might walk out again. And it could be as simple as 50p, but that's mm -hmm. 50p in someone's pocket. Like that's, mm -hmm. I always think like when I'm out and about, no matter like who I'm, I'm one, I'm because I was just brought up by my mum. So one, I'm representing how my mum brought me up. But two, I'm also representing every company that I'm mixed in with as well. Because if one company talks bad about you, you that can like reflect, as we've seen from various different YouTubers, without going into it too much. Some of my favourite YouTubers, it, it generally blows everything up. Like they've completely oh, done, yeah. they completely go, which is obviously really misfortunate. But I think that a question I'm always, you know, like to ask people is a, uh, what, how do you stay so driven in a type of environment where there is a lot of competitiveness and there is a lot of people wanting to be in your position? How does that keep you driven every day? Or do you use that to keep you driven? Um, I, again, that's definitely one of the things I think that keeps me driven. Um, I think one of the kind of things that's always stuck with me that my mum has said is that, you know, um, you, I mean, if, if, you know, if you go off sick or if you pass away or anything like that, there is always going to be someone that can fill in your role. So mm -hmm. obviously love who you work with and you know give them that dedication but there will always be someone to replace you um and I kind of use that as that sort of like well I don't want to be replaceable I want it to be that if I was to leave a company or anything like that like I would have sort of a, a you know a lasting effect that anyone that would then try and step up into it they'd be like oh well Tara did it like this or you know that sort of like you know I like to think I would leave a lasting um you know memory that you know that um, I was a core part of, of the team or the company or whoever. Um, but I think just keeping myself, you know, I, I have a goal in mind and I I only know I can improve on my skills and what I do. And, and I like to kind of, I put a bit of pressure on myself in all kind of careers, you know, jobs I've had. So I like to think that that's what pushes me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the idea of doing it, you know, a nine to five or, or or a job that is just a job to me I just know I wouldn't enjoy it and part of the enjoyment for me is that sort of pressurizing you know an environment and stuff so yeah I think it's that sort of like you know replaceability I, I just don't want to be someone that is easily replaced so mm. yeah it's, it's I mean I can definitely relate to you to be honest not in the work type of stuff um because I've never really had a job up until to be honest with you up until I was 24 I never um had a job up until then due to like I, I would go into it but I'm actually like semi shameless plug here I guess but I'm I'm recording like a documentary type thing to do with that type of environment so I'll speak to you about it after the, the podcast so we Definitely. don't have to talk about it now but uh, <laughs> I'm actually like, I never had it in it I always have the impression that like um like I would stay 20 I would be there 20 minutes before and stay 20 minutes after yeah. and even like it's even as simple as like taking an extra longer to finish my coffee after work type thing it's all deliberate and it's all strategic because I'm like I kind of want to leave that presence or Kel can you do this yeah. can you do that and the last job I walked in uh, walked into um, was a security one which for reasons I can't really talk about but it was at a certain place and uh, there was five of us four well I suppose there ended up being four of us but there was four of us that were mainly like your including myself so me and three other people that were kind of like your Scottish guys and the rest of them were from the company was from down south but like we were the only ones they had up here so uh, we had no supervisors so I ended up jumping into the supervisor role without like um there was no paid or nothing like that generally it was just because I've had in security itself I'd, at that point I had about seven years experience and the other guy had three so there was and the other, the other ones had three years because that's when the company started well it would be you know a lot longer now but anyway and uh, we uh so I kind of like took on that development role and then when I left to go back to college and stuff there was like a I think they lost the contract due to the fact that like they couldn't keep up with like the they're like why isn't yeah. this going the way it was going and people were like yeah that's because Kev did that job like they don't yeah. I think company I think um personally I think you should leave an imprint on a company where they're like when you do go um they're like for for like for example sake if you were ever to leave you know your company or anything like that they'd be like oh but Tara did this and they keep saying your yeah. name constantly 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 and then they're like and then the person would leave and they're like why don't we just hire Tara back like may as well just hire her back because it's bringing that type and that's what I've always worked to that's what I've always kind of had well, the they, thing as yeah. well so they kind of like they end up that. trying to get you back type thing yeah they had that um because I mean when I left the police it was you know it wasn't an easy decision to make it was very much you know starting a job in a pandemic anyway is always a risk but you know mm. I absolutely loved loved working at, at South Police and everything like that and it it wasn't just any job I was leaving for 
um but kind of part of of just the, the kind of routine I guess when I was working there I started doing it when I was an assistant and then when I became an, a corporate communications officer I was still doing it was running the kind of every morning and afternoon meeting that we would have you know going through the plan for the week and everything and I was so used to doing it that you know when I it was like my last day it's that sort of like well who's going to do it now and and I had kind of the first few weeks of leaving people would be like yeah no one's stepping up so kind of like we're having to tell people to do this you know it should have been something that everyone was doing anyway but when I was there I just I I loved doing it and I always like to think that you know especially first thing in the morning you know try and set the tone and the mood for the day and get people you know happy especially during a pandemic it's never easy you know working from home or whatever so um yeah and, and that sort of kind of like you know a few of my friends still work there and everything and they'd message every now and again being like oh someone asked about you know what did we do last year for this post and everyone would be like oh Tara did it oh what can we can we can we use what she did again and it's just that sort of like you know it's even now and I, I left six months ago and it's that sort of even now um there's still a little bit of me there which is I really really like so and it's not like a malicious thing or anything like that it's not like you know I'm happy that things you know are only brought up because of my name or whatever you know I've, I absolutely love loved working there and and I'm glad to know that you know I'll always have a sort of place there hopefully so yeah yeah I think it I, I mean, I fully agree, and I don't think anybody will think it's a malicious thing, to be honest with you. I think it's just confidence, and I think, to be honest with you, it's just confident in what you know you're doing is right, and it's not necessarily knowing, you know, it's, you know, just because I've got a phone there, right, you know, right there with my questions, just, it's not like knowing you've made that phone correctly, it's nothing to do with that, yeah. it's the fact that, like, you're knowing that you can make it more efficiently than other people, because you put in the time and the effort and the the thought process is like completely different type thing. It does come down to that, but that brings uh, me on to my favorite, one of my favorite confusing questions um, is that how do you value your time? Oh, how do I value my time? So I'm mm. guessing when it's not working, do I, how um, do I value it? Or like... It could be like from, well, I usually go by like when you wake up in the morning to when you go to sleep, how do you value that? Well, oh, okay. we'll say like um, 15 hours type thing because most people sleep for I don't know the mass and that I could have just got that completely wrong but say you sleep yeah. for eight hours so from for example from midnight to eight in the morning say you slept then for the like the rest of the day when you get up what's like your you know what how do you value your time oh um so I, I mean I'm an insomniac anyway so sleep isn't really a thing sometimes for me mm -hmm. um but if I like you know it's really really strange because a lot of the time, because I, I do, um, you know, I, I volunteer with British American football as well as my full time roles. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time is that kind of the typical nine to five hours of a day, um, you know, I are dedicated to work and everything and, and kind of uh, I it, when I do sleep, I do, especially kind of working from home at the moment. Mm -hmm um I do tend to wake up like just before I'm starting work because I need to try and get that like extra 20 minutes if I can um I normally start work early anyway um so just the second I'm awake I'll just kind of jump on the on the laptop and start working and, and get things booked in and stuff um so but you know when I do switch off from work like as in like when my kind of day ends I will try and do something um you know whether that's seeing friends or or whatever most of the time though that doesn't end up working and I just it's really silly because I, I mean I live in a little studio flat so I don't really have like an extra another room to go into or anything like that but mm. I will get up and I'll just go and sit on my bed and I'll you know watch TikToks or do something just to completely kind of switch off from work and and sometimes it's not as easy because you know sometimes work late and stuff like that um but I know I think that's one thing I need to start valuing my time more um because of I think working from home it's so easy just to be like oh another you know 20 minutes is fine and then suddenly like an hour and a half has gone by and it's like oh wow okay mm -hmm. um but yeah I think you know weekends for me are a big thing um I think that's where I, I kind of catch up on a lot of the kind of social side of life mm -hmm. um and I will always try and do something on a weekend whether that's go to Chichester and see friends or or, you know, even going up to see family all the way up into Shrewsbury for a quick, like, 24-hour trip or, or whatever, I'll, I'll do what I can. So, yeah, I think, you know, time, I don't value time enough. Um, and I'm learning that. And that's one thing I think I'm trying to improve on, especially, especially with the summer as well, you know. I don't want to be stuck inside working all the time, so. 
Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think now everybody that watches this knows exactly. I'll explain myself because I feel it's only fair. So everybody that watches this knows exactly what I'm going to say. But my the way I value time, right, <clears throat> is I woke up at when did I get up? I think I got up about seven o'clock this morning. So and I had a conversation with. Uh, I always have half an hour conversation with myself every single day, and it's with no phone because the first thing I do is obviously check my phone and it's check to see like, for example, I had a meeting with you today, so check to see if there's any messages and stuff like that. So. I'd, respond and I put my phone down and then but it's a couple of minutes and then sometimes I don't even respond back to messages it's more just to check and see if there's anything there yeah and then I always have half an hour conversation with myself and then just about what, what happened yesterday and how am I going to value that then obviously I'll be at the gym and then so the gym last night how what happened there did I have conversation with anybody and all that sort of stuff but if I'm having a conversation with anybody I always value like because we've been talking for a little bit now but I always value every second and every minute that you've given me so that's why I have to say thank you for your time in that but I think that even when I'm talking to somebody in a shop even that one second you can't take that second back so that's how I value time it's like I value whether it be a bad conversation or a good conversation I always value the time no matter what because it's time that nobody like when I worked on the doors and people are mad at me for throwing them out <clears throat> Obviously, I can't say what they said, but you could just imagine the words I'm getting. And I'm just like, I appreciate your time and thank you. And the raging and stuff. And like, how are you saying that? I'm like, because this is time, like in 10 years time, you can't get this back. When you pass away, there's no time you can ever stop. So I like, I literally value every single second that anybody's willing to give me. And it's more along the lines of like, um, due to a situation that happened that I will not, that I did tell you about that I will not be mentioning that you know seven months and stuff like that 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 that's why it's situations like that hurt me so much because like mm -hmm. I literally put if I'm putting time and effort into something I kind of like I really value my time and I know that due to me being um you know when I was younger and stuff like that due to me not valuing time then like really not valuing time uh, I think that I you know I wish I'd done like I wish I stuck in at school the classic classic thing that people say and uh but I genuinely do, and I wish that um, there's things like, you know, there's things I've done and, you know, when I, you know, when I decided I wasn't going to drink alcohol when I was 18 and stuff like that, was a, that was a big one because, you know, well, you know, before that, everybody went to parties and stuff like that. So as much as I say on that one, but everybody went to parties when they were younger, you know, so, and I, I definitely didn't value nothing. And I think that that's why situations and times when I get let down in that just now, it hurts me so much because I'm like, I put time and effort into producing something and you know yeah. doing that type of so it's a completely like a I guess because I genuinely think um you know I'll always talk so highly of women for this is because I was just brought up by my mum so like my mum has always like pushed in me you need to value time you need to do this because at the end of the day you know I was a little you know word I can't say in this when I was <laughs> when I was younger so my mum was always like you will regret this so you and I was like no I won't I'll be fine I'll be fine and no, you do regret it because she's like, you know, you need yeah. to value every single time you have with someone, but you need to always realize that if someone is causing you negative feelings and abilities, you need to push them away, which sways, which is a really hard, really, really hard to do. And it's gut wrenching, but you need to do it. But I'm curious and you don't have to talk about any situation because obviously it's personal stuff. Slides meant quite a good question is, uh, are you curious? Have you ever like um, had a, a negative person in your life and if you did how did you get rid of that and the reason I ask is because I've actually I asked this question um now who was it to I think it was a couple of podcasts three podcasts ago and I have actually had people come up to the gym and tell me you know I loved I love the whole podcast you've done but I'm really happy that you asked that one question because I'm struggling with a situation that I can't get rid of and I can't get rid of this person but it's hindering my career and then they've managed to take the advice they got and move that person away which some people I'll be brutally honest I'm definitely not saying names because that's really unfair but I've had somebody come out in tears at a situation that like I actually was heartbroken but I had to do it for like securing my situation securing my just to keep me going as well being so you know have you ever had to get rid of somebody and if you have how did you personally deal with it if you don't want to talk about it Oh, I, yeah happy to absolutely happy to I think um again like naming no names I, I no. have no kind of contact with this person anymore and and I actually lost a few friends through that because they only ever kind of you know they never chose to listen to my side of the story mm -hmm. um but you know I, it's a, a friend that um I had since secondary school you know loved it to bits and everything you know we, we joked along a lot and everything you know all through college she went to a different college 
um to me and everything and 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 all that and even through university she was one of the only people that actually came all the way down to Chichester to to visit and stuff and um you know I, I got quite ill when I was at university I think again the sort of like burning out I, I kind of overworked myself and and um you know I, that. yeah at the time I didn't realize it but I I um started having uh, endometriosis and which is a, a big um kind of issue and um uh, quite a few women's lives and stuff like that and it's what a sort of medical condition that um takes a long time to get diagnosed because you just a lot of the time doctors think oh you're just having bad period pains and all that sort of stuff so mm. by the time I didn't realize it until after kind of years after university um but then kind of moved back home and and started seeing her again and everything and we went out for my birthday um uh we went out for my 21st birthday and and I didn't have many people to go out with you know I, I didn't want it to be a big thing I just wanted a few of my kind of close friends and I think there was probably like four of us that went out um, and, you know, I, I put a lot of weight on when I was at university, not realizing it was because of this medical condition and, and you know, I worked my ass off to, to lose weight and, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing um, okay. to do. So I was, I was really chuffed with the work I'd done and I wore this kind of jumpsuit and, I mean, I suffer from psoriasis as well, which I have on my arms. So the fact that I was wearing something sleeveless, like, you know, it was really out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember kind of, you know, as, as girls do when you go out, they kind of go into loose together and everything. So she came with me and, and I was sat on the loo and I was like, oh, I feel really nervous. I was like, I'd, oh, like, I'd, I don't know, like, how do I feel? And I was kind of like putting my jumpsuit back on and stuff like that. And she just turned around. She's like, oh, you know, if, if, I, if I was you and I looked in the mirror, I'd want to kill myself. And I was like, sorry, what? And she was like, yeah, she was just like, you know, like, she's, and then she just started saying all these things. And I just, you know, I completely sobered up then to be like, wait, what on earth is going on? Jesus, um, yeah. And, you know, she, she said earlier in the night, oh, if we didn't meet at school, we wouldn't be friends. And, and then kind of reflecting then on kind of, I, I just, I just went home, you know, I just, I actually left, I went home, I completely, you know, I left my birthday night and I just couldn't do that. You know, I just thought, you know, there's having an opinion and, and being encouraging to someone that, I always known she'd been the sort of, you know, um, not bitter person, but that sort of, you know, person that would say something a little bit mean just to kind of encourage you. But then I reflected on all the things and the kind of the way she treated me throughout the years. And I just thought, I was like, you know, I can't have someone like that in my life at all. And I'd always kind of, I like to think, you know, I, I, now I'm a very confident person, but then when I look back, you know, a lot of that confidence, I'm, you know, I, anyone who knows me, I have a very loud laugh. I have a very, I have a cackle. So when I'd laugh back at school or college, you know, she'd look at me and tell me to shut up. And I felt very much that my confidence was, was kind of squashed. And then the second I kind of was like, you know what? No, I'm not having any of this. I literally, you know, I left her in that club with whoever and and that was it. Never spoke to her again. I, it was a very kind of like, you know, bosh done. And, you know, I there were moments where I was like, oh, you know, should I apologize for, you know, leaving her? And I thought, you know what? No, if she's going to be a kind of, you know, sometimes you have to be a bit selfish and a bit mean because I have to be putting myself first. And that sort of kind of at the very beginning of the podcast, where we said, you know, I'm very much a people pleaser. I was pleasing someone who would never like, you know, give that back to me. And, and ever since then, you know, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do what I want to do. And, 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 you know, I'm, I don't, I have incredible people in my life who are fantastic support systems and, and, you know, as a, as a girl, I don't know if any, if any other, you know, girls or women listen to this, you know, sometimes if you ask, oh, do I look fat in this? I'd rather, you know, they, they, the, my friends know now rather than being like, no, you don't. You know, if there's something more flattering that I could put on, they'll tell me like it's that sort of, you know, respect there. Mm. Um, whereas with her, it would have been a very, very different story. And, you know, when I was very when I was first friends with her, I was I was really slim. Like I was actually really slim. And, and back then I realized I had huge body dysmorphia because she made me feel like I was like 10 times bigger than I actually was. And and you don't realize that as a, a a slim person until you then become a bigger person that you were slim um mm -hmm. so yeah it was a huge mental kind of you know mind f there um and yeah just completely cut it and and never don't regret it at all yeah damn um, um <laughs> I, yeah that's that's taken me back a little bit because uh due to the fact that i mean i openly talk about it because i think it's it's important to be talked about suicide is a big subject for me in my life um and that's as much as i want to say on that one but that 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 i don't know this person obviously and i just met you 
technically like two weeks ago I guess but like <laughs> by you know obviously you're really working in that in which personally um well I'll say that in a second but I do want to say that that's probably like the most disrespectful thing you can say to somebody even calling somebody fat or anything like that but fat you that she said that you should kill yourself I mean how would she have felt if you'd done that you know I mean and coming from somebody that I mean I openly talk about has you know is lucky to be sitting here due to stuff this year and multiple years is lucky to be here I think that that's like a that's not a nice thing to say that hits home for me a lot but I think the fact that like um again I, I know I was a uh, really really overweight I was 24 and a half stone and I lost 12 just about 12 and a bit stone in 16 months so and I've I've developed that even now I walk about and be like I feel really really I mean I'm not but I'm always like I feel really overweight and you always still I think like mm -hmm. even you I think that having a, a support system there to be like you know you actually look really good it doesn't matter if you're overweight underweight or anything like that or you know normal weight as people call it which makes no sense to me but normal weight that you still look really good you know what I mean that's the yeah. thing and it. it's all about being known in yourself as well that it doesn't if you want to look if you want to I guess if you want to be slim if you want to be big if you want to be you know normal it's it doesn't matter like it, it doesn't matter to people you know what I mean I mean I I, I um it's it's hilarious because at the time you know I, I had a personal trainer and I, I would see him I think two three times a week you know I was going to the gym every single day I, I used to go with my mum she was like the best kind of gym partner ever and the one thing that kind of stuck with with me with um about you know weight and and everything like that is because of my personal trainer you know he I, I still talk to him now, even though I live, you know, down in Surrey and stuff like that. But one of the very, very first things he said to me was, you know, he, so he's, he's massively, like he is beautifully ripped, you know, like he has the, like, he's a runner. He's like, you know, gym is everything to him and he'll step on, you know, um, a scale or whatever. And, and, you know, when you do the kind of like, oh, your BMI and everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's to him that he's morbidly obese. And you look at him and you think, well, you're not because I mean I can I think you've got an eight pack on your eight pack sort of thing mm. like how can you be obese but it's that sort of like muscle weighs a lot more than fat and mm. um I mean I I when I was you know training with him and stuff like that you know I was doing huge on weights and stuff like that because I have a lot of you know strength in, in my legs and everything like that you know I'm very much kind of I guess built as like a rugby player kind of that sort of you know strength there and everything so I had to realize that you know just because I don't fit into her vision of beauty standards or whatever doesn't mean that I don't fit into anyone else's and I think the second I accepted that obviously I still have my days now where I'm like oh I don't even want to look at myself but it's that sort of confidence to be as well that I'm like you know what looks aren't everything and that's why I put so much into my career is that I want to kind of show off what I've done and people be like wow that's awesome like good for you and and just can see in my face when I talk about something I love that's where the beauty comes from is, is the sort of the way my face will light up when I talk about a project or something so yeah I'm gonna get that's real cheesy and soppy there but um yeah I, I just think that's the one thing again pushes me forward so no I admire that to be honest with you and the reason as well is because like um you know I still train at the gym six days a week two and a half hours three hours a day but it's more of a mental thing sometimes it's not that long because I really understand that there was personal trainers that watch this so I will get messages when this goes out and be like you train how long like you're not supposed to but it's, it's it's like a I feel at home it's really weird even though I know well it's weird because I know everybody there now because I have a I am um, I have this thing where um to to get helped me over like the situation that I told you about that obviously I, I like I said to you I really don't want to talk about it on podcast but to help me get over that mm -hmm. I, I have to meet a new person every day so I'm one of those people that genuinely will go up like for example on Saturday I went up and I had was no on Friday sorry because it was before I lifted a certain amount of weight but but this will make sense in a minute but is that I went up to this random um guy and girl they weren't together it was two different situations and the guy I had a conversation with him about weights and stuff like that and the girl I just genuinely went up and was like excuse me I hope you have a good workout and walked away and a lot of people would be like you must have been going to get her number and stuff it's like no it's just like a I need to have that meeting someone new like I had known obviously she did kind of look at me like <laughs> like who are you like I'm, this it was apparently our first day there but I was like just want to make people feel at home so it makes me feel good which is obviously what personal training does but getting back to what we we're saying I think that I think image now I've realized that when when it comes to image problems and image things like that from what people think it's uh even when I was bigger I felt 
I genuinely, I, I knew I shouldn't have been like that, but that was like, I mean, I was 45% body fat and everything, which obviously that's, I mean, I was 24 and a half stone, 45% body fat, which is really, 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 really dangerously unhealthy. But I actually felt all right myself. I mean, I was having like chippies every single day and I was having a beer every single day, but I felt great. But like people were like, I, f- I felt great. I wasn't great on the inside. But no. now that I've lost weight and then, um, which is why I wear a hoodie, but like it's, you know, I've kind of got the shape and stuff like that. It does come down to like, I actually feel more self-conscious now than I did when I weighed like that because I feel like everybody looks at you more when you look a certain way. Oh, yeah. But I think that... um it does come to who you social, who you surround yourself with as well. Like if you surround yourself, like I only surround myself with people that are driven, career driven, um, or are in business or, you know, shout out to a guy called Danny Cooksey, who's probably one of the most driven um, guys I know in business. And then the other one, um, Cammy Payton, who's a, he was play, playing semi-professional hockey when he was 16 and stuff. I mean, he's, oh. yeah, he's, he's incredible. But these are the type of guys I like to socialize, surround myself with because I don't like negativity like because I know this sounds really weird but I've never socialized myself with you know negativity because I'm quite I negativity really 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 affects me I love helping people and I'm more than happy to help people but I couldn't have that every day because I know that it, negativity eats me up personally every single day so I think if I had someone else doing that it would just completely destroy me personally so it does come like being selfish is it's not a good How thing but it, you know yeah, you have to kind of have that bit of selfish about you to be driven and career and be in that type of environment. But the fact that, like, um, I mean, the one thing I love hearing about people is, you know, losing weight. So good on you for losing weight. I mean, I know somebody that lost a pound and I was celebrating with him and stuff. And then we were, he was so happy in that, but he was like, but it's just a pound. I want to, I think he was wanting to lose five stone in two years. But that won't happen. He will lose it a lot sooner than that. Like, I was like, five stone, you could lose five stone in six months, like, easily. But so he, he would definitely lose that. But I was like, you need to celebrate the little things because that little win, well, you he's got a wife and kids, so that'll go home and he'll probably, I, I, I definitely don't want to get onto what he said about him and his wife, but it was such a, 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 a nice guy, but wow. But anyway, <laughs> he said he was going about him and his wife and then he went home and he took his kids out that night for McDonald's and he didn't eat anything, thankfully, I hope not. But like he, then when he went to the work the next day, he was so happy and stuff. So it's just, it's the literal little things that literally impact your life so the fact that like to get back to what we're talking about is the fact that you actually managed to realize even though you've known this person for years and years and years as much as it hurt you probably hurt you at the time you kind of need to get rid of them because you need to get rid of them and uh, I think that I personally went through that as well I know a guy since I was um when did we stop talking December last year and I'd known him since I was about 11. So 15 years I'd known this guy. And uh, I realized that he was just using me for my fact that, like, I'll take every, op- like, I've never really had loads of friends, so I'll take every opportunity to socialize with him and I'll leave opportunities yeah. and stuff. And I do that with other people. I do it with, um, you know, because personally I'm straight myself. I do it with girls and stuff like that. And I've realized that that's really, really a bad thing. Like, people gen- will literally and have taken advantage of me through situations. But... And I had to get rid of him and I was in the exact same seat in that in January time that I was like, damn, maybe I should message him. But then I was like, no, because why should I always be the number one? You know what I mean? Like, why should he not be the? And it turns out he moved down to uh, Leeds and because uh, I can openly talk about a situation that I, when he then he moved down to Leeds and I was like, oh, do you want to come see me tonight? You know, I haven't seen you in like a week. What's happening? He's like, oh, I took a job in Leeds. I'll see you later. And I was like... <laughs> And that was it yeah yeah I'd planned my life to we were going to move in together after this year and stuff and I was like wait a minute like yeah it, it was one of those it generally was like the because you would have had it yourself and I am going to ask you as well is that you would have had the self where it feels like somebody slapped you in the face and you're like whoa like it's like a life-changing situation that was one of them and the situation I told you about um was is another one that that's the second one I've had this year so I really need to like you know, because you can't say certain words on YouTube and Spotify and that, but I'm going to have to get my bum into gear now and just be like, you know, wow, that's that's hit me. But has there been a, you know, a slap in the face moment for yourself where you're like, I genuinely need to like switch things the way I'm doing around? I think it's it kind of uh, links to that sort of, you know, valuing time mm-hmm. question that you said earlier. It's that, yeah. you know, uh, it's sad fact is I, I've lost someone 
uh, passed away, you know, accident, you know, mental health, anything. Sorry to hear that. Every year, kind of, I think for the last four or five years now, and you know, it never gets easier, and 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 it's that sort of, you know, when it does happen, um, it it that I think is like a kind of reality check. It, that sort of like, you know, life is so short, and um, I think there's, you know, I'm very fortunate that the, every person that has passed away, I've, you know, I have pictures with them and stuff like that. I'm I'm that sort of person where if we're at a, a, you know, a party or, or just even just sat watching telly, I'll always try and take a picture because, you know, for me, it's that sort of like, I just, I want to be able to look back at that so that if something happens, you know, even if we never speak again or whatever, and, and you know, if we fall, fall apart or whatever, if something was to happen, I know I have these memories with you. I think it's that sort of, that would be a kind of like slap in the face of the, the kind of reality of, you know, life is never easy uh you know horrible things do happen and and it's that sort of you know taking things for granted and and again kind of sometimes you have to do what you want to do because life is too short and as long as you're not you know messing people about too much or being a bit you know mean about or anything like that then then yeah you know sometimes you have to to do what you want to do and 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 um yeah I think you know that that for me would be it yeah yeah damn so sorry to hear that that's did you say five people like and so a person so, every year? uh so i think i mean well 2020 i lost uh two people um i lost my, my grandmother and, and a member of the american football team I, I work with um so grandmother passed away from alzheimer's um and in a weird way so for, for me again that kind of valuing time you know um she she lived over in ireland with my, with my pop-ups and they were the reason why I got into filming and videography and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, what I did for, for my mum was I, I collected all this footage that I'd taken throughout the whole, you know, all these years and put together that kind of this one last montage of kind of, of granny. And, and, and for me, that was like a real full circle moment, you know, that kind of like, you know, this is why I do what I want to do and, and be in this industry because when I gave that to my mum, the you know the reaction like she's gonna have these memories forever now like she mm. she said to my sister that she didn't think that she had that many with granny and she kind of regretted the fact that you know they went over to Ireland and and we weren't able to get it and because I mean me and my sister were very fortunate we grew up with our all of our grandparents mm. um and and granny was the first one we lost so you know it's that sort of like being able to actually be like no mum look you have all these memories and not only you but mom like me dad and, and my sister Sophie like we have these memories like you like don't ever forget that um and then and will sadly pass away in a motorcycle accident so um it's those kind of moments where you just you wake up one morning thinking it's going to be a certain way and, and it isn't um and I think it's also the kind of moving on from that as well as like well what happens next like you know it, it never gets easy going back into your normal routine because there's always going to be a little bit missing um and I think it's a strength to be able to do that but also you know never forget that you know a, a part of your routine is missing so yeah I think it, it, it yeah damn that hit home as well a little bit but I think more along the lines of because uh you know from no I've never really who was the last, the last person I lost was my Auntie May. We were really close. And that was back, um, that was when I was 17, so nine years ago. But we were really close. We used to go to uh, Woolworths together and things like that. So that shows you how long ago that was, you know what I mean? Yeah. She was my best friend and stuff. And that was when that was when I started realising that you have to kind of value time. And then, mm -hmm. you know, obviously becoming technically sober at 18, it kind of like, it kind of, that hit me home. And I was like, you know, I really need to start proper value in every single minute with somebody which again is why I literally do appreciate your time and appreciate everybody's time because I'm like it's you didn't need to do this like there's no as yeah. I say to everybody you didn't need to give me five seconds I mean you even replying back to someone's message even you know people that have said yes people that have said maybe no um is that you have to uh even say no is like I appreciate your time, thank you very much, because they still spent like a minute reading your question and then reading what I said and then replying back, which obviously, you know, means a lot to everybody. But I want to um not to end it on a on a on a, a I really <laughs> it's, it's it's a nice note, but it's a negative note. And I think I've got a question that uh, I think I guess because within media there is a lot of fears of um 
you know, what you do, what you say, have you done it right? Have you done this wrong? And obviously fear is face everything and rise is how I take this, what it means to me personally. It was what a salesman for Pennycook, which he worked for like, selling windows. But this, this man was like, I mean, he used to have a 500 pound pen and he used to have like five or six of them and replace them. I mean, this man was he used to come in with a gold Rolex and everything. he was proper, <laughs> first time I'd properly ever met like a proper, proper millionaire, right? It was, it was mental. And uh, he, he asked me this question and uh, I, I couldn't answer it because I was like, I don't know. It was my first kind of like ever getting into speaking to anybody in promotion after losing all the weight and then trying to get myself back out there again. But I think it's, um, have you ever had to face your fears before? And if so, how did you deal with it? Ooh. Or if you didn't deal with it, how didn't how did you not manage to deal with it? Would be a good one. I think so. I think facing my fears, um, I think I'm still learning what like my fears are. You know, it's that sort of as much as I have all this confidence, I still get so anxious talking to people, especially of a kind of you know management level. Um, and you know, it's that sort of like learning to not be a yes person. I the, the fear of saying no now uh, is definitely a, a thing. So you know, um, um, because I'm still getting over it. You know, I, I, this year I've definitely learned to kind of you know fight for what I think is is right and and everything like that in you know in career and personal life. So um, the one thing that has helped me do that is <laughs> I've called my mum. And, you know, I've called my mum and dad and I FaceTime them um, and, you know, would be in tears or, or whatever. And it'd be that sort of like, right, you know, get it all out. Tell us everything. Let's come up with a sort of like, like, how do you feel about it? Like they wouldn't tell me what to do. They would help me, you know, come to that decision by myself. Um, and, you know, it's that sort of like they'd be a bit like, right, OK, have you done it? Like, you know, you said you're going to do this. If you haven't, why haven't you? Like they'd be you know really open and communicative and and that has really helped you know the kind of the fears of the industry and and kind of any big step I've had to do um and you know I do use the fear though as a kind of um encouragement in the sense that you know if it scares me then it obviously means I have a, a strong feeling about it whether it's a good thing or a bad thing mm. but it's that sort of you know I guess if you look at it as a game it's that sort of checkpoint in life that um if there is that fear there then this is a moment in my life which is going to you know set me on a path now mm. um and I like to think that there are checkpoints in life where when you reach it you know it's it's a big moment um and you're meant to get there how you get there is you know a complete different journey and story so that kind of fear element I think you know when you can sense that kind of nervousness or you know that kind of sticky feeling getting your stomach I think it's because it's going to have a big impact and um, even if it's wow. only a small thing so wow that's, that's very true I think that one one question um I actually just remembered there is that um is is because I don't it's because it's I, I think you now everybody that knows the podcast or that knows that roughly there's mainly six questions that I ask people because it's few questions that I went out <clears throat> personally went out and did some uh, market research and then asked people if you were to ask anybody that was in your dream position what would you say and it's always the classic <clears throat> excuse me why did you do certain things but have you ever heard of the it's called the what if factor have you ever heard of that I feel like I have heard of it yeah yeah it's kind of it's like a what if I don't do this what is how is yeah. it going to impact me and or for, for for example, what if a situation, what if I do get rid of someone, what if, what if, what if, but like usually if you're questioning from what I've come to experience, and I'm going to ask yourself, well, what I've came to experience, if you are using the, the what if factor on something, usually it means it's not right. Usually mm -hmm. if you're questioning a situation to what if I don't do this situation, it's like <clears throat> usually there's going out of your comfort zone and there's doing something that you just do not genuinely want to do. And I feel if you're using the what if factor what if I do it what if I don't do it you know pros and cons type thing but I think that people don't realize that if from what I've the experience I've helped people is if you're questioning it that much that you're like what if I do get rid of this person or what if I don't go to this job interview or what if I don't buy this car finance or you know get the rent this place or something like that usually it's because you don't actually really want to do it so you're starting yeah. to find reasons so have you ever had to have you ever thought about the what if factor before and if you have have you ever used it for like a you know what have you ever used it for if you want to talk about that obviously 
Yeah, no, I think um, I think subconsciously I probably used it. Um, I think it's that sort of, you know, because, uh, I mean, for me, my dream is to always work at Sky Sports or the NFL. Um, mm. So it's that sort of what if, you know, what if I miss up? <clears throat> if an opportunity is, you know, presented to me, I think, you know, what if I don't take it? You know, does that, you know, will that get me further from my dream or will it get me closer? You know, it's that sort of like, what if I don't go home this weekend and see my parents? It's that. I mean, I always have that. I mean, I've got massive anxiety a lot of the time, so I always have that anyway. And I think it's choosing to listen to it when it actually is not anxiety and it's actually me questioning. It's, 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 um, yeah. So I've definitely, I think subconsciously, you know, not realizing I've used the what if theory. I think a lot of people would say that they've used it without realizing that they're actually using it. So, um, but I think it definitely kind of, you know, leaving the police and joining esports, it was like kind of, you know, what if I don't go for it? I, I, you know, I was ready for that next moment in my kind of career and, and, you know, I, I wanted to to get that one step closer and I thought, well, you know, yes, it's a pandemic. Yes, there's a risk, you know, to start up or whatever, you know, but what if I don't take it? You know, I knew I'd be, you know, constantly looking up at it on, on social media and YouTube and all that sort of stuff. I just thought, you know, what if I don't, I, I know I probably wouldn't be happy and, and I wouldn't know what, you know, path I'd be going down. So yeah, def- I think that'd probably be the, the most recent kind of big what if and and just yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's and it's a really hard one. And the reason I say it again <clears throat> is for the whole um, you know, what if I don't do this and what if I don't do that? I've had quite a few situations where and I've I, I'm okay to talk about the situations as long as I don't mention certain things. So because I've obviously spoken to people before in that, and then one of them, the situations was a uh, the fact how the guy was wanting to um, finish everything with, he actually found out news that he's glad he finished with his wife, but I think they're going through lawyer stuff, so I can't talk about that. But he did say that he was wanting to leave his wife from that because they were just two different, completely different people, but they've been together for years and stuff, and they were literally like, he was so into business, you know, really, really, really successful. And then she's into, what is she now? She's something to do with the NHS, but it's not like your normal nurse doctor. It's way up in that. It's like way up in the office. I don't know. I don't know what it is. All I know is that they're they're a really really wealthy family. Well, we're a wealthy family, but yeah, he, uh, he he had that situation. He was with her for years and years and years. And I said to him, I said, look, could you imagine her with someone else? And he was like, no. And I was like, okay, could you imagine her being with you? And he stopped. And then he was like, do you want to be Kelly? I can't. But I can't imagine it with someone else. And I'm like, that's the that's the mo- that's the what if factor. What if you were to do it? How is it going to improve your life and stuff? And he's actually been, you know, got I mean, he well, he's put it, he's like doubled his net worth, is a good way to put it, over the last year and a half. So yeah, it's just really impressive for himself. I think he's only 33 or something, so it's, it's crazy impressive. But uh, over the last year and a half, it's really affected him. I affected her big time as well. And obviously I didn't know her though, so I can't comment on any how she's feeling, but all I know is that I think that what I want to write home to people that is uh, if you are using the what if factor for people for situations like that, you, you should maybe should take a step back, put the phone down yeah. for once, which I think people need, even though I'm involved in social media and so is yourself on that, there does come to that time where you do need to turn the phone off, just even for it's for half an hour a day, yeah. just to fully clear your mind. And once, like I use the gym and once people clear their mind and that, I think of the gym, they're going to like, help themselves and that's what helped him and obviously he became even further away from reach from me but the yeah I think that um again if, the, if is, is, is there anything like um well is there anything if young Tara was in front of you right now what would you tell her oh oh no I've never been artist before um I think if young Tara was in front of me I would say you know use the use the negativity you'll have in your life to be something that will lead you towards positivity so you know as much as the next person I've been through things in life and you know there have been certain moments you know from childhood up until like last year where you know it will always have a kind of impact so using those moments to to be the person you're gonna be so kind of learning from it to become who you are today and I like to think that you know you know I have good friends and it's because of who I am and you know um lasting kind of career effects and stuff like that because you know who I am in a a workspace and stuff so it's 
using those moments to kind of be who I am and just to know that you you're gonna get there um and that you know you may not think you're, you're skilled as you want to be and there are other people that can do massively flashy things and stuff but just you have the work ethic and the passion and the drive that is you know second to none like it's probably a bit vain but you know I, I like to think you know I am probably one of the most you know determined passionate career-driven people I've ever known you know of anyone I know um so to not think that's it's not a flaw it's actually a real kind of um credit to yourself so yeah just keep using that and be be that be that person yeah 100 percent. I couldn't agree with you more to be honest with you I think that I um as you can imagine um and you probably did it yourself when uh you know you're working with your PT guy and that that we um you use the negativity in the gym all the time and that's where you really like explore who you are as a person is because of the way you react to being put under weight not just yeah. necessarily gym weight where it be um weight from work and weight from pressure and that that's who you really are and you know it it, it definitely helps which is why I try and encourage people to I mean well there we go the an RAF plane decided it's going to fly over <laughs> us <laughs> Is the, the Ministry of Defence on a base like really close to here? So it's they they I think they're testing uh, the planes out this morning. Um but yeah, I think that uh I think that when you can re- when you can uh, go to the gym and I always that's why I tell people to go to the gym. It's nothing to do with like I know I, I've told somebody to go to the gym that is genuinely has no interest and usually just sits in the bike for like half an hour, but like and goes the slowest pace. Like he pays like 50 pounds a month, but goes the slowest pace he ever wants to go. But it generally just one of those things is just he he gets the feeling I have it's where it's just common just common being in that environment and watching people lift weights and you know because you it's can watch people. Out. Yeah. yeah yeah he doesn't even he has no int- you know the guy um but he has no intention of ever lifting a weight or ever doing mm-hmm. anything more than cycling as his his 50 pound a month is crazy but it's, it's <laughs> you know is what makes him happy so I think that I think but when you have that outlay you can use negativity and stuff and he uses the negative that as a negative process and negativity he has to then be better at when he goes home and things like that but is there anything um is there anything you want to say like personally you want to say to anybody that's listening to this that's career driven or maybe like dealing with negativity or maybe because you talked about it the dealing with somebody that's maybe like you know had to take in their own life or anything like that do you want to speak on do you want to say anything to anybody before we end yeah I think you know um I definitely I think up until last year maybe late 2019 you know I very much felt like emotion was a weakness you know you know some I think especially around the workplace um you know I felt like grow I I don't know why I always just thought you know who you are at work is going to be who you who is very different to who you are you know with friends or whoever and even with friends I surprisingly I mean I've spoken quite a lot today but I used to be quite um withheld I guess um and you know I, I wouldn't if anyone asked me if I was okay I'd be like yeah I'm fine even if I wasn't um and I think it's you know being open is never a weakness especially in the workplace because I was very lucky that when I worked at the police you know I I completely opened up and and got you know had a, a real kind of not emotional breakdown but I guess a, a moment of realization that I just I couldn't do I couldn't hold it in anymore and and I know credit to to my former manager Jay you know I, I will always shout at him out about this because he would just you know he took me aside and he just let me like you know like cry it out almost and I think there must have been like years of like pent up emotion or, or whatever. And I just, I think I sobbed for like 45 minutes. Um, and, you know, I have since then have learned, you know, I put emotion into my work. I put emotion into friendships, into family, into relationships, because you have to be open with yourself before you can be open with anyone else as well. And I think that, you know, it's never a weakness. So if you aren't, doing okay like you do like to to actually say it um whether it's just say you know I'm not doing what to us they just don't worry about it though from that to kind of like actually talking about it with you know I I have like I said I've got great friends and we um a few of the girls we've got a small little group chat and every now and again one of us will just be like look girls I'm having a really difficult day and they'll be like just type it out you know rant about it tell us all about it and being able just to physically get that out is a blessing and I you know um I think it's that sort of you know comfort there so yeah I think you know yes don't you know don't 
overboard it or anything like that but definitely kind of don't hold anything in because then since then you know I've I like to think I've done really well in my career and, and it's and like enabled me to go for things that I never would have gone for because I don't have it pent up inside me mm. so yeah yeah I think you know and again you have done incredible in your career and a big well done to yourself and I do want to say thank you for your time again because at the end of the day as I tell everybody that you never have to give anybody any minute but the fact even like you reply back to a message and even though like you know you were busy yourself but again for me personally a lot of people would be like you know frustrated as you can imagine but I was like that's cool because I realized that if the more work you're doing the harder you're pushing towards your career so it's perfectly fine if somebody if anybody's ever out there watching this and you know you're a little bit nervous about saying no or like I don't know it's don't, don't take offense to it. it's perfectly fine because I think it's I think it's great because that proves you're actually doing something versus <laughs> you know doing what other people do which is sit around the house and not actually do anything with their dreams it proves you guys are actually working hard towards something so I admire as weird as it sounds and I know I told said oh, everything I said before but I actually admire when people are like you know we're going to need to push it we're going to need to push it because I'm doing this I'm doing this I'm doing this it proves they're actually doing something versus like you know if they're just you know, the people that turn up, obviously, I really admire that as well. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I'm pretty sure everybody will get what I'm trying to say there, that even though if yeah. you're pushing something and pushing it and pushing it, it's cool because it means you're working hard towards something and it's it's more rewarding for me because then I get to talk to you about it and then push out and stuff like that. So I do want to say well done and I want to say um, I'm sure everybody will thank you for coming on as well. And yeah, before we go though, um, do you have an Instagram and Twitter you would like to shout out to everybody? Yeah, I do. I mean, I have uh, I have my own personal one, uh, Instagram and Twitter, which is just Tara, Tara underscore Bunker. Um, and then I do have a uh, photography Instagram as well, which is just Tara Bunker Photography. Um, so, yeah, that's that's those. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll leave I'll get them. I'll get you to send me all of them just so I don't type it out wrong. And then <laughs> I'll, I'll get you to send me them on a LinkedIn and then I'll put them in the bio so everybody can check them out. And yeah, I want to say thank you very much to yourself again. <laughs> And thank you very much for everybody watching. And uh, because I don't say it enough, I want to say like, comment, subscribe, because usually that sort of stuff, I just have a passion for talking to people and helping people. So I, I never tell anybody to subscribe and everybody keeps saying that's a really bad thing. So subscribe, everybody, like, comment. I hope everybody has a good day. And uh, just remember, follow your dreams and pay attention to um, follow me and Kyle's combo. And if you really want to follow my personal Instagram, it's Mr. Big Kyle MBK. So I go by. The reason I created it is because I want to have a, a platform for something that's coming that I did kind of drop hints to in this podcast and the last podcast, but you guys will see it soon. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you. I'll see you later. Bye bye.